and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Today we've got uh, Debbie Howard. She's uh, the chairperson of the Carter Group, a market uh, research agency here in Japan with a long history, with a lot of know-how and uh, deep understanding of the culture, the market, and the customer trends in Japan. We're going to hear Debbie uh, tell us uh, about the white paper and uh, well, which uh, the Carter Group uh, produced recently, the specific characteristics of uh, the Japanese senior market and uh, the, the consumer trends here. Debbie, before we dive into the main topic, so uh, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got connected with Japan? Can you hear me? Your mic is open. okay. Thank right. Okay, there you go. Uh, thank you so much, Maya and Tim, for having me today. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be there. And uh, I'm I'm talking with you from uh, Austin, Texas, right between Austin and San Antonio, Texas. And this is where I've been um, grounded during COVID time um, at my home here. Uh, I actually lived full-time in Japan from 1985, and I see there's a few friends of mine in the audience there who know me from back then, actually. And um, yeah, I, I've had a long-time love affair with Japan and lived there full-time till around 2015 when I started living half-time in Japan and half-time in the U.S. And, um, you know, my fascination with Japan has just always stayed very strong. I'm very fortunate to work in market research, so I get to study Japanese consumers across a wide variety of categories. So everything from skincare to food and beverage um, and onward into my current passion, which is age tech products for Japan. Um, I was watching the aging challenge in Japan grow uh, with my time in Japan and um, it's just been an amazing thing to watch for all these years and to be able to be researching now. Um, I noticed many differences being an American and a researcher uh, between the way older people were treated in Japan and are treated uh, compared to how we treat people, el elderly people in America um, and other countries. And of course, it's very interesting to look at the cultural differences um, and viewpoints of aging. Uh, and I won't get too much into that today, but, but I think all of us who live in Japan know that, you know, it's a pretty, pretty nice place to, to be older. And uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, um, is that world in Japan of aging. Yes. So, uh, well, Japan, as you mentioned, it's a, a very different e uh, ecosystem from, uh, uh, well, other let's say other countries and of course uh, there are cultural reasons for this but there are also other reasons and we have seen that uh, well um, there are quite a few uh, things which uh, we need to be careful when we talk about the Japanese market and when when we think about it and well when I say the Japanese market I mean the Japanese senior market here so um, well and you recently published um, well, the Carter Group published a white paper and uh, I, I saw the white paper, I read it and uh, I found it really very interesting and very exhaustive in terms of uh, what the specific features of the seniors here uh, are. So uh, could you please tell us a little bit about that? Some, what are some of the unique characteristics of the Japanese uh, uh, seniors and also of the Japanese age tech? ecosystem. Okay, okay, thank you, Maya. Um, 
So I'm going to give a lot of basics today and I invite everyone to download the white paper as well. And I also would like to uh, offer that if, if any of you have companies and you, you want a, uh, you know, a, a one hour presentation, um, 30 minutes with Q&A, of, uh, in other words, a live walkthrough of the Age Tech white paper, I'm very happy to do that. Um, you need to do them in the morning like this <laughs> so that I don't have to stay up till 10 at night. Yes. But I'm happy to do that for, for anyone, anyone who would like that. Um, we have all the materials all really well organized and, and ready to do um, presentations like that. So let's just, just dive ask, into the data. Debbie, just if you allow me to say, yep. to say, well, the white paper is available on the homepage of the Carter Group. So uh, everybody who wants to, to have a look at it first, please uh, uh, download it there. And then, uh, well, you can always uh, contact, contact Debbie uh, and arrange uh, the presentation time and or probably an online meeting with her. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Yes, it's www.carterjmrn.com. And I think you'll be able to find the white paper there pretty easily, hopefully. And if you have any trouble, just let me know. So um, <clears throat> we're talking about aging in Japan. And I know that many people in the audience know a lot about Japan. And some of you probably know more than I do. But I know the numbers related to aging and caregiving. So uh, let's talk about those right now. Um, you know, right now, Japan is the most aged society in the world. And, um, and it, it, it will continue to be the leader in this space uh, for at least till 2050, I expect probably forever, because Japan has such a head start. Um, we have a very long life expectancy, 87 years old for women and 82 for men. I believe that's the highest, if not the highest, one of the highest in the, in the world. Uh, when we look at the percentage of the population, that is 65 or more, it's nearly 30% of the Japanese population. I think it's 29 and change. Um, so uh, it's, that's an amazing number in and of itself. And what's really interesting is when you see what the numbers are for the other countries. So the next country in line after Japan is Italy with 23% of the population 65 or more. In the U.S., that's 16%, half, half of the number in Japan. Um, and then, of course, all the other num countries sh shake out right around 12 to 15%. I'm talking about developed countries like the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, etc. So the numbers vary a little bit, but certainly Japan is winning <laughs> with that number. And we know that it's going to increase from... 30% now to 40% by 2050. So those are huge numbers and they create huge problems in a society uh, with healthcare costs, with shortage of healthcare workers, uh, with uh, pressure on the pension system and how do we care for these aging population members. Um, it, it's, it's just a really huge number and it, it and it, it does create many, many um, challenges. And due to the size and the growth of it, um, it's, it's a huge size of the market. In research, we've often focused on young people uh, to, to the, uh, you know, I think to some companies' disadvantage. I think it's, it's uh, not very intelligent not to look at aging people as a consumer market. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to get into needs and products um, at the end of this group and products next week. But, um, you know, it, in this case, in Japan, we're talking about 36 million people. You know, so, you know that's, a, that's a really big market. And I, I've been saying for uh, easy 10 years in various articles and things like that, that every company no matter what they sell, needs to be looking at the aging market in Japan and thinking about what they can do to capitalize on that. 
to maybe not every single company has a product that might be applicable, but many, many companies do if they put their thinking hats on. Um, did you have a question, Maya? I heard you. Yes, I was uh, just is that an okay? observation um, um, that 36 million is uh, a population larger than uh, the populations of uh, so many other countries in the world. So, uh, well, it's a huge... Exactly, yes. Yes. exactly. And, yeah, I was, I was just going to add that it, in addition to being 36 million, they have more savings than many of the people. I mean, it's a huge percentage. I forget what it is, but... It's a, there's a lot of money, you know, saved, a lot of cash that that market holds as well. Yes, there, there, there is, Timothy. Yes, and uh, well, you go, Maya. Thank you, Debbie. It's probably because of the life, lifestyle and uh, the well, the yes. ecosystem here as well. Uh, the Japanese people are generally healthier than uh, people in other parts of the world, so. Yes, indeed. There is so much to look forward to when you think about uh, the potential of this market. Debbie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, not at all. It's it's a really exciting talk, I think. <laughs> so, speaking of the finance, let's just talk for a minute about that. Um, so, so they the the aging people in Japan have higher purchasing power than their younger counterparts. We know that. Um, we, we also know that uh, they're fairly well set when it comes to retirement and aging. And I'm not saying that there are not problems in Japan. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that there are many more older people in Japan who are living well and, and stably financially from a financial viewpoint than let's say in the United States where we have a huge problem with older people, 65 plus, not being ready for retirement. So um, financial stability and security in older age and not having to worry about that is a really uh, important point and it does contribute to better quality of life. Uh, we also have, as you mentioned, Maya, uh, Japanese people being more physically active and healthy for longer. We, we have a fabulous um, history in Japan of people listening to, <laughs> I think, the government about what they need to do to stay healthy. And we also have a really good uh, national diet in general. I'm not saying there's not junk food in Japan. I'm saying in general, the traditional diet of Japan has contributed to the healthier lifestyles. Um, so we have higher quality of life with physical health and emotional health, and part of that's related to financial security. We also have Japanese people being super proactive about staying active. You'll see people riding bicycles, and you don't see 80-year-olds riding bicycles in, in the States. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> and, and you know, we, you know it, part of it is our more sedentary lifestyle in general, but uh, I think we, we, we can be, it's quite interesting in Japan how active the older generation is. And um, we also see older Japanese people being super proactive about learning new skills. There's a, there's a high demand for adult learning, um, in, not only in universities and formal institutions, but also um, in co with courses and hobbies and sports and that sort of thing. So there's some really, really interesting, um, I think, individual responsibility behaviors that are happening in Japan among the aging population. And these, these give them a higher quality of life for longer as they are aging. Because I think what's important to remember is that it's not just about living as long as you can. It's about living as well as you can while you're living longer. And uh, that's one of the important things I think that makes Japanese culture and, and Japanese aging population so, so different from other places in the world. Um, we have another factor that's very interesting in Japan is that assisted living and nursing homes are far less well penetrated since, uh, than they are in the States and other countries. Um, 
that's because, of course, the tradition in Japan was to care for our parents um, in multi-generational households. And even though multi-generational households are on the, on the uh, decline overall, uh, we, we still have a lot of uh, care for the aged and a lot of attention and a lot of hands-on help from family members. Uh, rather than like in the States where we've tended to outsource care. And uh, um, I, I, I think we, we are seeing some really interesting things in the States now with the um, w families walking that, that outsourcing of care back because we're seeing uh, with COVID families bring their elderly home to live with them in the interest of safety. And they're even saying in the States that we're going to uh, probably see 20 to 30 percent of the assisted living business go down the tubes um, sometime, you know, from now until the next few years. And that's because capacities are now low, lower than their, their, their 30 percent off. And that's the 30 percent they were able to make ends meet with. So there are some really interesting things happening. But in Japan, of course, you don't have as much of a choice with assisted living and nursing. And so that means that we have a lot of elderly living in single households, um, living, in, living in households on their own, either with a partner or by themselves. And we know that of the 53 million households in Japan in 2015, for example, 30% of those were 65 plus. And about half of those 65 plus households were living alone. So older people living all alone. And of course that, that points towards support for those people, monitoring systems, technology that can help. Um, it, it just starts boggling the mind when you think of the needs of those people. Um, and I, I would like to just say right now that, you know, I use the word elderly every now and then, but I actually, and we as a business, try to stay away from using that word. I'm trying to use aging care these days um, because nobody who's, and I'm 67, so I don't want to be called elderly, right? right. Like, and I don't want to be called a senior citizen either. And nobody does. I don't care if you're 65 or 85, you don't want to be called that. So we're using aging population these days and it takes a little bit of writing around, um, but it's, it's doable. I think it's more respectful. So please forgive me if I use the word elderly every now and then as I'm talking us through these points, um, because sometimes that's, that's just what rolls off the tongue a little easier. Um, yes, we are used to the term and uh, the term seniors, but well, it's really interesting to note that, well, basically people in their, well, into their 70s and their 80s too, they're very active and uh, what we, what we think about, uh, what we think when we say seniors is really different from uh, what it used to be in the past. So yes, your point is well taken. <laughs> Thank you for making it. And, well, and, it, and I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but also I see a, a, a big range. So I'm 63 and I, to, to say it in a nice way, I, I feel, sometimes I feel like I'm 28, you know, I, I just like my mind and my body is not synchronized, right? Another way to say it is I'm really immature still, but I have a lot of friends in their 60s. Um, and we're all active and we go out and have fun. We play music together. And then you got, you know, my mother-in-law who's 90 years old who can barely walk on her own. So there's gradations of, you know, your ability and what you can do uh, once you, you know, so where do you define that? It's kind of a difficult, it's a spectrum almost, you know. Yes, yes, Tim. And I'm glad you brought that up because... I think to from a marketing viewpoint, it's it's a huge mistake to lump everyone 65 plus to 100 and whatever into the same bucket. That's just yes. insanity, right? And and there are even in an age bracket of 65 to 70, there are many types of 
aging people, right? There are super active and able to do whatever they want when even from when they were 20 or 30, like you said. And there are some who have disabilities and have mobility issues and maybe start having eyesight and hearing issues. You know, those all affect us at different ages. And it kind of depends on how well you take care of yourself. Um, but there are other factors as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really uh, interesting area. And I think I just want to make the point that when you're developing anything for Japan, I mean, you'd want to be looking at the specific customers who you're trying to sell to. So why wouldn't you do that with the aging population? Why wouldn't you try to understand the needs of different kinds of, of aging people? So yes. and that gets, gets really involved when you start talking about technology because, um, you know, you, you have, you have resistors and rejectors and, but you also in Japan, one of the other nice things about Japan is that people are generally really open-minded to technology. And I know that may sound funny um, because we know from the West that Japan's a little behind on some things like, like workplace digitalization and those kinds of things. But, um, you know, I think what I can tell you is two things. Um, COVID has really escalated that uptake of digitalization in Japan, and we've all seen that. We've been part of it. Um, but the, the other thing where we know from our research, with and we go into homes and talk with caregivers and care receivers and uh, people of different age groups in the aging world, so the youngish active types and the ones who have more trouble with mobility, you know, we try to represent a lot of different kinds of aging people in our studies, obviously. And we, we find that um, actually Japanese aging population is more open to technology helping them with aging than, say, Americans. Um, and and we, we know for sure that Americans tend to have um, you know, this, this Terminator type image of, of robotics, for example. Um, and we're kind of moving naturally into the age tech, but um, you, you, don't, you don't get that fear of robots in Japan the same way you do in America. Yeah. It's very interesting. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that one. I think Japanese people are super practical and they know they need help. So they know they're going to have to be open-minded about it. But the other more important point, perhaps, is that Japanese companies have been so amazing at delivering technology and manufacturing prowess that we can believe that a Toyota or a, a, another Japanese company could actually have a chance at delivering some of the stuff they're promising. Right. And, and we have yep. a lot of we have a lot of trust, I think, in Japanese companies. Um, and I, I say we I, I include myself in that. But um, but I think those are some interesting points to consider as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And one of, I, I mentioned this before on a previous clubhouse, but I saw a survey somewhere. I mean, it could have been Carter Group. I don't remember. But Japanese elderly were saying that they would actually <laughs> prefer to be taken care of in their old age by a robot than by mm -hmm. a human. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was very surprising to me. It, it is. It's a really surprising thing to hear that. And I've heard that in research too. And, and part of that, it's interesting, Tim, that, um, you know, part of that is not wanting to burden somebody else. Right. And, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And so there's a really interesting, and, and Me there's also, them. Yeah, and there's a, there's the the idea that I could ask a robot some to do something that I might not want to ask my son or daughter to do. Right. So right. it's it's a really uh, fascinating area, um, but that that is a real plus for those who are companies who are making uh, age tech type products, you know, and that's why we call Japan the world's real time laboratory for age tech. We've got, yes. we've got the numbers, we've got the open-mindedness, 
we've got the money, we've got all kinds of uh, really, really good tailwinds behind us when it comes to age tech. Yes, indeed. And I wonder, well, there, we also have the cultural predisposition, you know, to, uh, well, let's accepting machines and robots in our um, everyday life here in Japan. But also there must be, because, well, aging is universal and uh, aging care sounds, well, you know, taking care of uh, the people who are uh, in their, let's say, advanced um, stages of life. So it, there are pretty uni some pretty universal problems, but at the same time, so in addition to the ones which you mentioned, the advantages which you mentioned, Tim and Debbie, so are there anything, any other things which, um, well, you know, Japan is doing uh, that could be applied uh, in other markets? Sure, sure, Maya. Uh, I've, I've thought about this a lot and actually the whole thing with the pandemic has been um, really, I, I want to say an excellent opportunity for me because I've been, a, I, I was grounded here in the States and it, it, after 30 years of living full time in Japan, it, it has given me a chance to look back at my own culture with new eyes as well. And, and I can see that, for example, and we do, we, we have completely different healthcare systems that, you know, there's some really obvious things that are different, but Japan Inc., Japan government and Japan Inc., if you will, they've done a wonderful job with education and awareness building of what it takes to have high quality of life with aging. And as a result, we, we talked a little bit about this in the beginning. We have individuals who are proactively taking actions to keep their physical and mental health strong. They know what they need to do and they do it. And we don't, we, 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 I think we know what we're supposed to do in the States, but I don't think a lot of us do it. <laughs> so I just, I, I, and I'm not, I can say that I'm American, so I can say what I want about, about America, <laughs> but, um, but it's been super interesting to look at that culturally. And I think another thing that we, we need to look at, and this is a global thing, we have a healthcare system that kind of is not focused on prevention, but it's focused on fixing things. And so the money is not in prevention. And so we don't see a lot of effort at education and marketing for preventative type actions and products. But I think, for example, in Japan, you have the national health care system, you have annual health exams. Um, you know, I've heard friends tell me that they were told if they didn't lose weight, their insurance rates were going to go up. And I think this is annual health exam is an amazing trigger for uh, keeping keeping people in line and, and, and helping people to keep themselves in line. And we, we have things like this in the States, but we're kind of rebellious and, and, and we, don't, we don't follow the rules the same way the Japanese people do. And that's to our detriment when it comes to preventing uh, your, your future health problems, um, if you ask me. Right. Go, go ahead, Maya. I see yes. your mic there. Oh, that's, yeah, that's okay. Uh, well, I keep it open so that... Uh... We, we save seconds anyway, but Tim, I can see your mic is open now too. So, yeah, I it, did. You have something to say? Because I, 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 the annual checkups are are wonderful, and you know, in fact, my ninety year old mother in law goes once a month now, and part of that is the insurance covers it. Um, the insurance here covers testing, but in the U.S. We all know the insurance companies will do everything they can to not pay for anything. So tests are often not recommended because if they're negative, the insurance will say, oh, well, here's a $10,000 bill for your MRI. So I think that also compounds the problem in the U.S. as well, because you never know if, if the diagnostic is going to be covered by your insurance company. So here it's all very friendly toward, you know, the, you know, the diagnostics that can help you prevent disease, you know, before it progresses. 
Absolutely, Tim. And that's and and so in answer to your question, um, both you and Maya about, you know, what can we learn? What can we lo- what can the rest of the world learn from Japan? I think we can learn about this education and awareness building and this individual accountability for preventive health care. That's sort of one big bundle of, of work that absolutely could be addressed by certain sponsors and public service campaigns and that sort of thing. And we need to do some work in these other in other countries to make sure that the the information is accessible not just to people with means, but people who may not have means. You know, we need to think about the diverse societies in some of the other countries. See, Japan is super homogenous, so it's 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 a little easier to get everybody going in the same direction. So there, there we can't fix that part, but we can fix education and awareness building, uh, with a goal towards uh, you know encouraging and inspiring preventive health care. Um, and then I think the uh, the other issue is is ageism, honestly speaking. Um, Japan reveres its elders in a different way than we do in the States. We, we revere youth and youth culture in the States. And that's, that's, um, that's a sad state of affairs. We, we need more intergenerational living. We've got some of that in Japan, but we need more of that in Japan and, and elsewhere. Um, and, and of course, these are very big systemic type issues to, to address in any society. But I think Japan's done a pretty good job on those. And it gives Japan a leg up in addressing its, its aging population issues. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned about the preventive care dimension, and I think there's a, another strong cultural strain running through it. Um, I lived in Japan for, I'm sorry, I lived in uh, Hawaii 14 years before I moved back to Japan. And so I was kind of involved in the tourism industry. Obviously, the Japanese market was huge, including the elderly, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, what's the word I'm supposed to use? The The, aging population. The the aging population. Sorry. Thank you. Um, And I heard an unbelievable statistic that Hula was so popular in Japan that there were, at the time, this was like uh, maybe 2012, 2010, and I don't think it's changed, but there were 500,000 people in Japan studying Hula. And a huge chunk of that are people over 60. And it's the ideal exercise because there's a very strong social element to it. You get to play dress up. It's a kind of cosplay. You get to wear flowers in your hair. (laughs) It's got it all. (laughs) Right. Associate with like-minded people and you're doing things together. Um, So there's that very strong social aspect, which I think is underrated in terms of continuing good health. I mean, they're already seeing data that supports the power of connection and socialization in keeping people healthy. And Mm. so I think that's another very strong um, uh, incentive besides the actual physical, um, you know, uh, dimension of it. There's that social dimension. Yes, yes. And that's, and we're going to be getting into, uh, that's definitely one of the needs areas we'll be talking about at the end of today and getting into uh, even more next week. Mm-hmm. And I love the hula story. It's, it's so great. I, I've been to a few hula events uh, in Japan, and they are truly, truly fabulous. Yes, indeed. And I didn't know the statistics, uh, but yes, I was also amazed when I heard this now. And yes, Debbie, so you touched upon uh, the cultural differences between the Japanese uh, market and uh, other foreign markets. So you talked uh, about uh, the uh, acceptance of machines and uh, robots in everyday life. Also the um, physical exercise, and that's the preventive health care and the attitude here in Japan. So how different it is uh, when compared uh, with the attitude in the United States. 
and also uh, I think that you mentioned uh, uh, the stoicism a kind of uh, the Japanese people how they don't want to really burden uh, their loved ones uh, with uh, care so that um, well basically they would rather rely on uh, robots uh, than uh, well ask uh, directly for help from uh, family and relatives so but I wonder also uh, so you're the founder of Aging Matters, right? And uh, the author of uh, The Caregiving Journey. So what are uh, well, the differences uh, in caregiving between the US and Japan? Could you give us a little bit more about that? Sure, sure, Maya. Um, whoops, am I on? Okay, yeah. Um, yes, um, well, like I said, it's been really interesting for me to see uh, my own culture after having been so immersed in Japan's culture for 30 years. And, and you know, if we just look at the U.S. and Japan, uh, the sheer magnitude of the aging and family caregiving situation in Japan is even more dramatic than in the U.S. So 30% of the population, that's double the 65-plus population in Japan, double that of the U.S., um, and that means, now I, I, I can tell you this as well, um, the numbers are not as well reported or locked down as they are in the States. So I have done some research on the caregiving situation in Japan, but it is grossly underreported. If, 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 <laughs> if all these other numbers are true, then there are clearly more caregivers than are self-identifying. We call it self-identifying in research. Um, so there are a lot of people who are helping their aging parents and loved ones who are not calling themselves caregivers because, you know, it's the thing that they're supposed to do, right? right? And they just accept that as a normal part of life. So let's just, I just want to caveat the numbers with that. But we we do know that there's double the amount of, uh, of th there's, there's twice as many in the population as in the U.S. So... So 30% 65 plus in Japan, 15% in the U.S. Um, we think the percentage of caregivers in the workforce must be naturally higher in Japan than in the U.S. And we know that in the U.S. it's at least 30% of every workforce, small, medium, and large companies. 30% of every company has uh, of the workforce is giving some level of care to an aging loved one. I'm not including moms and parents who were severely disadvantaged during the pandemic. I'm talking about people like all of us in the audience who are taking care of their aging loved ones. So 50 plus care, if you will. So we, we know that there are many more people in the workforce in Japan who are doing that, playing a caregiver role in some way. Um, and, and I guess it's got to be 35 to 40 percent. But I must tell you, I just found a statistics for the states today that was up upwards of 40 percent. So it could be even higher in Japan, but we just don't have those numbers yet. Um, the average age of family caregivers in Japan is older than in the U.S. So in the U.S., our average caregiver age is 49. And I'm not talking about professional caregivers again. I'm talking about family caregivers like us who step in to fill the gaps that the healthcare system has has no way to fill. Um, and, and so we've got the average age in Japan is 65. So we've got older people taking care of the older people in Japan. And we've got some of the oldest old up in the 80s and 90s actually taking care of their mates. And I've heard stories in Japan. And I, we're going to open the stage up pretty soon. But, you know, there's there's all kinds of stories that'll make your hair curl for sure. But, um, you know, I I hear stories of um, couples, men and m man and wife, who Maybe one has Alzheimer's or the beginnings of dementia, and the other one, they're, they're basically covering. One is covering for the other one because they know that if the children, the grown children, find out what's going on, that they're going to they're gonna do something, like put them in a nursing home or, you know, do something that they don't want to happen. So we, we have some, some 
some things like that happening as well. And, and it happens in the States too, but it's just an important point to know that the, the age, the average age of a family caregiver in Japan is, is quite a bit older than, than the States at 65 to 49. And we also know statistically that caregivers, family caregivers, absolutely suffer from emotional strain and stress. Um, 30% are clinically di diagnosed with depression. We know that many suffer physical health problems as well, and many also suffer financial problems. So if you're, if you're starting your caregiving adventure uh, or journey at an older age, the impacts are likely to be even more difficult for you because you're, you're starting at an older age. And I think that's, that's a really important point to, to remember because what, what happens with caregivers and, and caregiving is that if you, if you can't find a way to manage it so that you're not burnt out by the end of it, um, your life will be disadvantaged for the rest of your life as well. So what I'm saying is that it's, it's actually a health risk and the caregiving uh, situation was named the next global uh, the next global healthcare crisis back in 2014 or something, way before COVID. And uh, so we, we know that it's not just the thing you're doing right now to take care of your loved one. It's what happens to you afterwards if you can't manage that very well. And one of the things I do worry about in Japan with this um, especially with the depression and the emotional strain and stress of caregiving, is that Japanese people are so stoic and so gaman, and it it mean and we don't have a good uh, we don't have a good acceptance of therapy and coaching in Japan, generally speaking. So there's 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 not the kind of resource there that 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 our caregivers in Japan might actually need, and they may even be afraid to ask for help because it doesn't look right. You know, it's not, it's not the right thing to be complaining about your family obligation. So I just want to mention that because I think it's really, really important um, that we recognize the role of these caregivers in Japanese society, and we recognize the very huge pressures that are on them and we try to find ways of supporting them well i just learned that we are average then because i'm 63 my wife's 65 and we are taking care of our you know our, my mother-in-law uh and we're very lucky because we have a strong support system my sister-in-law lives two minutes away and we can you know pinch hit for each other taking care of mom um and yet, still, there is stresses created by that. We deal with it by, you know, occasionally putting mom into a, a short-term stay facility uh, just to give my wife a break from, from taking care of mom. So it's kind of interesting to hear that those averages. Um, yes, yes, Tim. Well, you're, 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 um, I definitely want to interview you. <laughs> Yes, you should. Do that. I have lots of stories. Right. You know, and I, I'd like to say one other thing there, um, Maya, about the caregiver in Japan, and and then we'll, we can open it up. But um, you know, we actually have seen statistics that show that lack of elder care is a much more likely reason for a Japanese woman to leave the workforce than child care. And we know how bad child care support is in Japan, right? So, so the statistic is 38% of Japanese females leave their jobs due to lack of elder care compared to 32% who leave due to lack of child care. That's an amazing statistic. It and is. that's going to get, um, you know, it's going to get, it's going to get more pronounced. Yes, indeed. It's going to get as the, the elderly population uh continues to grow indeed so and it it looks to me like uh, well because of all those problems and challenges which uh, 
Japan is facing, and of course, not only Japan, but the countries which are following Japan uh, in this uh, in this sense of the word. So there are areas and fields in which uh, obviously services can be provided, and there are a lot of opportunities for. Uh, let's say organizations and also businesses, uh, you know, to step in and fill the gaps. So, what are those uh, areas? I guess one of them is probably medical. So it comes as uh, an obvious uh, conclusion. But uh, what are the other areas, uh, which? Uh, so yes. Okay. Well, medical is definitely one of them, Maya. Um, absolutely, and financial is one of them. Um, because if you if you're not uh, organized financially, your old age will not be as good as it would be if you were organized. So there's also the question of handling of finances as people get older and maybe become um, less able to handle their own uh, finances. So there 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 are lots of dimensions in that area of financial as well as in medical. And then the three other areas that we name, we name five, medical, financial, lifestyle, which is about mobility, safety, and learning, social and communications. We've already talked a little bit about that today. And of course, health and wellness. Um, and, and these are the areas, these are the big five buckets that we can look at when we start looking at um, products for the aging in Japan, whether they're technology oriented or not, but certainly uh, for the technology ones, when we talk next week, we'll be getting into some examples for each of those five areas. Yes, perfect. Well, that's uh, fascinating because obviously there is a lot of, uh, a lot of work to be done there. And I can see a huge uh, uh, pool uh, where we can develop, I mean, as a society, a lot of services, both human and uh, technical services, can be developed. So, well, I'm really looking forward to uh, our next conversation. But before that, we've got uh, Yuta. Hello, Yuta. Hi, Maya. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you very much for coming up on stage. So, Debbie <laughs> mentioned you this morning, uh, well, before we started the room. So, uh, thank you very much for coming indeed. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. This is yeah. great. Uh, this is great conversation, by the way, and a great statistics. And then I totally agree. I cannot agree more what you guys are talking about. And then actually, I'm doing my own the uh, second uh, startup right now uh, to focusing on aging care, so aging tech. So it's a very um, yeah, fruitful discussion. Well, that's wonderful. What uh, if just a, a brief question? So what is mm -hmm. uh, your second startup? focusing on, uh, on, of course, it's uh, aging care, but uh, anything specific or? Yeah, it's basically focusing on more like a caregiver centric uh, solution uh, using uh, some technologies that we invented. So um, yeah, it's, it's just in a stealth mode right now. Uh, so uh, sorry, I cannot disclose much right now, but right. yeah, hopefully in the, in the next uh, few months that I can disclose that more detail. Well, I hope so, and I hope also that uh, you're looking at uh, the Japanese market uh, as well, not only the American. Oh yeah, <laughs> big time. And then I think the uh, Japan market, if I look at all the statistics on numbers, and since I'm Japanese also, um, I know the fact of what's going on in Japan right now, and it's just a severe pro serious problem, and then it's just a financial ready crisis and uh, uh, lack of the uh, labor resources. It's a lot of challenges exist, and then I think that we really need to do something with the uh, about it. And then I think the uh, starting point is I think how we can make the caregiver life uh, much uh, a little easier, you know, yes. than uh, than today. So I think that's definitely one of the key uh, ingredients to make these things work. So that's the area that I'm focusing on. Right, I'm sure that Debbie agrees with you. Uh, well, if not a hundred, probably a hundred and twenty percent about. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank you. And then Tomoko, good morning. Can you hear? Good me? morning. Yes. Oh, what's your question or experience or um, well, your comment today? I know that yeah. you're also passionate about about this. So, let us know. Yes, um, I think one of the reason why, um, sorry, I'm, I'm morning. Um, I think the uh, one of the reason why Japanese 
um, system is really good at uh, about the um, prevention of the to be a uh, to become ill is the existence of a public health center or public health nurse. I mean, Hokkenshi or Hokkenjo, because they've been educating the um, people about uh, to prevent to become the ill. And I think that kind of the, um, the prevention assist, prevent, to prevent, to educate to prevent is something happened like over 20, 30 years ago because of the, the certain areas, um, the the public health center in that local area realized that the death rate or high blood pressure are really higher than the rest of the, the Japan. So that they and they know the the reason why behind because of the the food um, they've been eating, so that they decided to intervene to educate people locally. To what to eat or how to reduce the uh, salt, for instance, and it was very, very successful. And, and still, the uh, public health center or public health nurse are educating people what to eat, uh, not only at the um, because the annual uh, health checkup, but also the, their jobs. Um, and also, um, um, I've been discussing with one of my uh, friends in Denmark uh, regularly about uh, silver economy rather than the um, age tech. Uh, she's been in the industry for more than 10 years. Um, the world is really catching up and she also realized that she can't, she thinks that the, in Denmark, people are not, uh, People cannot expect to have the really good uh, elderly care like their parents or their care, uh, grandparents were receiving. So that's why she she started uh, acting in the industry quite some time. So um, looking at the Japanese system, probably the I also I'm been telling people that looking at uh, Japanese system and um, doing the research about how we are handling the situation that the world can learn and the world, the, the country will be catching up anyway uh, about the situation. And two more things. Um, one is that the, we also have to think about the issue of the uh, young caregiver, because even they are really little, uh, young, like uh, teenagers, they've been giving really um, helping parents to give the, the care, assist, care because the parents are getting married very late age and uh, when the, the children get a uh, certain age, already their parents are like over 15, 60s and so on. So then we also have to think about them. And lastly, I can't remember what I was. And also because of the COVID, um, the long hauler, or, I mean, long COVID people will be really uh, affecting our uh, social care system. So that we also have to think about that too, uh, not only for elderly, but also the, in general. That's my all my comments. I'm done speaking. Tomoko, I have, I have a question. Um, so earlier, Debbie mentioned that in the US, there is no, there's no profit incentive to promote preventive, you know, preventive, you know, approaches to, to maintaining good health. So I'm wondering, since Japan is a single payer system, um, are there advantages to the system, unlike the U.S., to promote preventive health care? Or I, I, I put that question out to everybody, though. Well, definitely just because of the uh, national health care system, national care, um, national health care service. Um, you know, we have only one budget by the government. Right. So that, yeah. um, 
yeah. the government or the public health center has the incentive to reduce the number of patients. Sorry, I think I have a problem. Yeah. How about you, Debbie? Any thoughts on that? You know, I, I, I'm still trying to dig down into that problem. Um, we, I actually go to a clubhouse group every Thursday, one on rethinking aging and one on preventive care. So there are a lot of good people working on that problem in the United States. But I, I don't, let me, let me just say this at this point, Tim, I don't have any good data uh, about it, but I know there are some very good and well-intentioned people working on the problem. And I have hope now that I did not have before. Does that help a little bit? Um, there are some great startups now that are working on uh, solutions that help not only the care receivers, but also the caregivers and come at that problem from a prevention viewpoint. So I do, th I do think that we, we're going to, you know, it's going to take some work, but I think, I think that there are lots of people working on that now. And I think somehow we might get there. I'm not sure where that clipping is coming from. I oh, hope it's not me. I, 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 no, I don't, I don't hear it. Uh, so I guess my point is uh, definitely in the U.S., um, I feel like we need to find a way to incentivize preventive care if that's the end goal, right? And I, I was just wondering, as, as Tomoko mentioned, because you have the national insurance system, it seems like there would be an incentive to push preventive care because the government keeps prices down and controls them and for, you know, maybe many other reasons that are beyond my, my knowledge base. So that was kind of where my uh, um, question was coming from. And well, anyway, yeah, well, uh, you know, Tim, it's such a big question. I don't think we're going to get there today, but honestly, oh, no, not, you know, like it's, it's kind of like, um, there are clearly, in my mind, incentives to being more preventative, right? Because if, if we can prevent, we won't have the big problem that we have now in the future. And if we don't prevent, we are going to have an even bigger problem. <laughs> so it's a pretty, it's a pretty basic thing. But uh, let's, let's hold that for another conversation because I think it's a fabulous topic. Yes, it is. Oh. Hello, Red. Hey, uh, good, morning. good morning. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hello. Thank Hello. you. I, I just want to thank you for opening this room. And, and Debbie, uh, thank you very much. I listened to your presentation with uh, great intensity because I'm, I have my parents. I do have to worry about this. And so I'd like to uh, echo uh, uh, your point. I just want to echo. Um, and then one more quick one question after that. The, I am I'm actually in IoT, Internet of Things industry. We have been doing the smart house and smart building stuff with all these sensors. Um, but to your point that the Americans are less uh, comfortable with the technologies, I just want to share one experience that uh, um, in the trade show, and our sales guy was trying to convince the customers that, hey, this is smart house, this is smart home, this is smart, smart, smart. And I have to walk over to him and says, can you stop mentioning smart house, smart uh, home? Because according to the data, most of the American people do not want their house to be smarter than them. <laughs> so um, smart house or smart building is just a method or means to the end. The end is really about what you were just talking about, which is not about getting all only. It's getting all and well. I think you mentioned the word uh, well. Well-being is more important than just getting old. And I think a lot of people in the industry sector, in, in my industry, uh, we tend to forget how important it is that the technology is n nothing more than the tool. The goal is really about the quality of life improvement not just the technology, how good it is. So I'd like to echo, I would like to echo uh, your point on that. And, um, and then uh, another, the, the other thing is my, my question, uh, should I say, I would like to uh, get your thought on this, which is, I think, uh, by the way, I'm a US citizen, uh, I'm, I live in the US. Um, I think 
America has a unique problem, which is a bigger problem, I think, because America is a, a country of immigrants. So a lot of my friends, including myself, actually have uh, their parents living back in Japan or Italy or all those places around the world. So how do these Americans take care of their uh, older parents overseas? And in, in many cases, they have to, as you mentioned, it's a, a huge handicap to their career. Um, they have to say, you know, uh, to their company that I have to be out of office for maybe a year and then they may fly back to, I don't know, Finland or wherever they they were originally from and take care of their parents in overseas and then fly back to the US or maybe remain there forever. And and I was thinking uh, if you could uh, share some of your thoughts or experience or what you have observed about those cross-border parents, uh, you know, age uh, caring, um, and thoughts on that, I'll be uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ren, for your uh, comments. And, and I really want to talk with you later as well about your smart home products and understand those. Um, I, I, bet, I bet they're really interesting. Um, let me talk a little bit about this caregiving from afar. That's what we call it. And, you know, the reason I'm so passionate and got so involved in caregiving in the first place and wrote one book that came out the end of 2018 for individuals and am currently writing a book for companies. Um, the reason I am so passionate about it is that I myself became a caregiver while I was living abroad. So the opposite situation from you, I was living in Japan, uh, had been living there for 24 years when my mom, who lived in South Carolina where I was raised, uh, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And for the first year, uh, she, she was given one and a half years to live. And for the first year, um, I, I started flying back and forth a lot more frequently. Um, I'm also super fortunate to have two younger sisters and one sister lived within one hour of my mom's house and the other sister lived within three states away. And, you know, we all know how families have moved away and you know in the old days we we all lived together in the same town forever but now we don't do that and and it's become a global issue as you so well pointed out um, so i was able to manage and my sisters and i were able to manage for that first year fairly well giving my mom the support she needed through chemotherapy pro uh, 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 whatever, you, I can't think of the word, <laughs> chemotherapy courses and the like. And, um, and then, but the last six months when we realized my mom would not be able to live on her own anymore and she absolutely needed 24 seven help, um, th my sisters could not help out. One was married, working with two kids of her own and the other lived three states away and was in a new job. And both of them had used all of their family medical leave uh, up after one year of the three of us helping each other. And so because I was an entrepreneur in Japan, uh, I was the only one with the ability to control my situation well enough to leave and go home and help my mom, which I did. And I, I was so lucky to have a fabulous Japanese team. I left my young uh, w one of my I, I left someone in charge who had been with our company five years but she was only 30 years old and she was running the day-to-day -day operations of my company in tokyo and this was back in 2007 um we we thankfully had uh, a lot of the things in place that we have now um, i was already a laptop lifestyle liver you know on the plane and everything else um, so it was easy for me to just take my business and and do it from another place remotely. Um, but of course, you know, it's different from actually being there in the office and running things. But I was able to manage that fairly well. And um, we, uh, you know, I, I'm very sensitive to these problems of 
caregiving from afar as a result of my own experience, Ren. And um, I, I have a workshop that I give called Caregiving from Afar that gives people tips and, and, and gives them a chance to talk and ask questions about their individual situations. And we try to come up with strategies to, to make that a little better. Um, it's, it's hard to make it better, honestly, uh, when you can't be there. Um, and COVID has only complicated the situation. Um, my, my hope is that through my work of amplifying the problems and doing things like this, this, this clubhouse session even, um, although it's, it's more about age tech and a market opportunity in Japan, the caregiving subject quickly is, is brought up because, um, you know, we have so many care receivers who actually need help of, of real people and, and, and technology is one of the tools, but, but having people and love and compassion is another side of, of the challenge. And, um, I, I guess, um, I, I'm, I'm on a, uh, I'm on a crusade to get corporate America first and then corporate Japan to acknowledge the needs of 30% or more of their workforce who are caregivers and to put in programs that actually help caregivers to make their plans and manage their situations as well as they can. Um, so that's, that's what I can say about that today, Rin. I, yeah. I'd love, love to chat with you some other time too. Yes, yeah, let's do that because I, I must say I'm really moved by your comment because I thought you were going to provide general feedback, but I didn't expect you were going to share with us about your personal experience. And, and to that, I really appreciate that. I think many people in this room are also uh, really appreciate that as well. And, and uh, the caregiving from far, that's what a powerful word. I think that should be some kind of a keyword uh, moving forward for all human races, in my opinion. And, and the, uh, the, the other stati statistics you mentioned, um, the, the Japanese uh, woman in workplace actually, uh, what was it, 49% did you say, versus uh, uh, for child care, which was 30 some percent. That, that was another shocking number to me. It, it, it's, it was shocking to me too, mm. Ren. I was very surprised when I read it, I did a double take. But I checked it. I double checked it. <laughs> Can you repeat and that uh, percentage? Sure. For, for sure. Uh, uh, it, it, the statistic is that um, if we ask Japanese women for the reasons why they leave the workforce, 38% right. Right. say due to lack of elder care hmm. and 32% say due to lack of child care. Okay, what's well, thirty eight percent? I misheard us. Maybe yeah. I, well, in it, my brain, I was thinking forty percent, but that's about. It's good. It's it's close enough, honestly, yeah. and um, it's going to get it's going to get more. Mm. It's 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 going to get bigger, and Japan has a huge challenge with uh, shortage of healthcare workers. We all know that, and mm. it's it's a it's a big problem that the caregiving uh, demands is is going to really press on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. And thank you, Debbie. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.